I would like to welcome uh, Roz Tampone and John Duran from the Fresno Master Gardeners. Uh, they have graciously um, working with the Fresno County Public Library to offer a series of programs. And I know they're gonna be just so full of information and fun to do. I know I've been looking forward to this. Uh, my name is Laura Fleek. I'm a adult programming librarian with the Fresno County Library, specifically the Woodward Park. And just to let you know, we will be having five more programs uh, over the next two months. Roz will tell you about those at the end of this session. Uh, John is going to be discussing the summer vegetable gardening and he will be taking uh, questions at the end of the program here. So start going ahead, setting them aside uh, to put them in the chat window and let me hand this program over to John. Thank you, Laura. There we go. Thank you, Laura. Now you can hear me. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Master Gardener Zoom class. Uh, we miss all of you. We miss uh, meeting together as, as uh, friends. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to continue uh, sharing some of our experiences in the garden. No, I am learning. There we go. A little bit about me. I'm a retired high school teacher that began my career as a vocational agriculture instructor in Salinas. I ended up as a special education teacher when uh, I had to develop a, a program in Salinas uh, for special needs kids. We did what was called an adaptive horticulture program. And uh, that's where I started with my, my gardening experience. I was born and raised in Hanford. I'm a bull pup. Um, my childhood dream was to become a forest ranger, but I ended up in a teaching career, which I loved. I taught for 34 years. Uh, I taught special needs kids and I was a hands-on, I'm a Cal Poly graduate, so I believe in the learn by doing. And uh, so I had my special ed kids doing all kinds of things. I did not lose my passion for the summers. I worked with the Youth Conservation Corps program out of the Minarets Ranger District for 21 years with my family. I have a lovely wife, four children, Two boys and two girls. I have eight grandchildren and two on the way. We have twins that are, uh, are due in August. <clears throat> Most of you have experienced, have experience in vegetable gardening. So I want to take a little different approach today. I'd like to talk about eight common mistakes that gardeners make. Number one, starting too big is a challenge. First, let's begin with the size of our garden. We often get excited and want to plant as much as possible. My suggestion to friends and friends and family are to, is to start small and grow from there. Start with what you have. If you have an existing flower bed, convert it to vegetables, or better yet, mix them up. I have flowers mixed in with my vegetables and all of my gardens. I love to plant in containers so I can move my plants around if they need more sun or to protect them. My grandkids love to pull the carrots up from the garden pots or pick the strawberries from the containers. I also love it because I don't have to get down on my knees. I can work uh, with the elevated pots. Our first tomato story is we moved out to the country in Clovis. Uh, we had eight acres and we were excited. So we mowed all the weeds down and rototilled and probably put in about three or 400 tomato plants. Well, about mid-July, we ran out of water and uh, we learned very quickly that one or two tomato plants was just as good as 200. But you expand as you grow in your experience and you build on your experiences. Choose your battle. Corn is very hydrogen, uh, excuse me, corn is a high, heavy nitrogen user and you spend years building up your soil and then in one season destroy it for a dozen years of, of corn. Be smart and visit someplace where you can purchase four years for a dollar. Um, you don't wanna destroy that. You choose disease resistant varieties, early mature dates. This is a picture of my neighbor's front yard, the one on the top. He wanted to plant pumpkins for his two children. So he planted the whole front yard and it took up a lot of space. He did get pumpkins, about one or two per plant, but it does not, excuse me, there wasn't much more that he could plant. The bottom picture is my container 
of lettuce and beets that I grew this winter. Be honest on how much you can eat. If you produce a lot, you share, you can, or you freeze. I grow a 40 plants of tomatoes, about 15 different varieties of heirloom tomatoes, but we each share and can and save the seeds for our plants for next year. You can also grow a row for the hungry and donate to a food bank. You can make use of your space by number one, succession planning, number two, vertical gardening, or number three, using dwarf varieties. Know your climate. Understand your climate. I have a friend in Texas right now that she says it's still hailing and raining quite a bit. It's pretty wet. Here, our tomatoes in my garden are, are loving this, these warm days. Many areas in Fresno County have microclimates. I think I live in a place, there was a creek at one time because my soil is pretty sandy. And when it's, there's frost, there's frost on my plants, but not on my neighbor's rooftops. Know the early and the late frost dates. Vegetables are classified into two categories. The cool season vegetables, which are a leaf, a stem or a root, and a warm season vegetable, which are fruits or vegetables. Cool season crops are planted August through March when the weather's about going to drop down to 55 or 75 degrees. And the warm season crops are planted March through September when the weather is about 65 to 95 degrees. Summer plants need eight or more hours of sunlight. <clears throat> Choose your correct varieties. Choose correct varieties for your area and plant what you're going to eat. I planted heirloom tomato varieties versus hybrid. Heirlooms are varieties that have been around for many years and can be grown the following year from the seeds that you save. My wife doesn't like me because I squeeze all the seeds out of tomato plants. Out of, excuse me, out of the tomatoes. Hybrid varieties are a cross of two plants and the seeds do not reproduce the original plant. An example is a seedless watermelon. It takes two different watermelon plants to produce a seedless watermelon. An example of an heirloom tomato is what we call the mortgage lifter or the story of Radiator Charlie. In the 1930s, Marshall Biles lived in Logan, West Virginia. Biles owned a small repair shop at the bottom of the mountain, which was well known for making trucks overheat. The location of his shop generated a steady uh, business as trucks overheated on the mountain and had to roll back down for some much, nece much needed necessary radiator work. This is where he earned his name, Radiator Charlie. Despite the prominent location of his shop during the Drake Depression, he also suffered with a lot of other individuals. Marshall sold his tomatoes for $1 each and he paid off his mortgage. His mortgage was $6,000. So don't be afraid to, to experiment, ask friends, master gardeners, nurseries, what works. Reminder that the big box stores often just purchase by bulk uh, what's available. So do your homework. Um, the best advice, I. I recommend is, is getting information from gardening friends. <laughs> Garden smart, start your seedlings in six packs with potting soil for early transplant. Start around February or March. Do not use the soil from the ground. It has a bunch of microbes that will probably, um, that don't help much in the germination process. This also helps you by not having to fight weeds in the garden. I know people who get frustrated when there are more weeds than the vegetable starts and can't separate the vegetable seedlings from the weeds. Remember to choose your battles. A little trick, I often go to Walmart and look for the early grilled tomatoes. A six pack is about $4. So I look for all the six packs that have a double plants and I remove those cell double plants and place them all into one six pack. I end up with 12 plants instead of six when I bring them home and transplant them into bigger pots. My wife walks them away from me and she says they're watching me on the cameras, the security cameras. Now, if you don't want to pay 450 for a tomato plant, start your own in January. I start mine the first week in January. 
you can get about 30 plants in one package of seeds. This is a little trick. You can't fool mother nature, but you can trick her. On the left side is a six pack of tomatoes that were started in January. The next are pints. And what we do is the root hairs or the trichomes, if you plant those deep into the pints, those will eventually become roots. So you'll see the pint growing. And on the right side, uh, I'm planting a tomato down into one gallon. I don't have a current picture because I've already put them in the ground, but those tomatoes will be about 18 to 20 inches tall with buds. I have some with fruit on them and I've just planted those into the garden. Now remember the garden is too cold. It needs about 50 to 60 degrees temperature. Tomatoes love heat. And, uh, but in these black containers, one gallon containers, what happens is you just put them in the sun and they grow, they love it. About mid-March, I transplant them into one gallons. In April, they're huge enough to go into the soil. Remember that you want to heat, you, excuse me, remember that they want heat and the only part of the soil that is warm is the top few inches. This is where you remove the lower leaves again and plant them sideways or lying down in furrows. The top of the soil is warm, deep down is cool. The next day, the upper part of the tomato plant will upright itself. This is called phototrophism. Plants are designed to grow up, not upside down like in a hanging basket. You'll have early tomatoes and huge tomatoes. Before I start, I started keeping a calendar on what I do and when I, when I planted to keep track of what's going on. Remember the climate is changing. We have some unusually warm weather now, but we can have a quick frost and I've had that happen and lost my, my harvest, my plantings. You can also do succession planting and crop rotation. For crop rotation, I can recommend four growing beds or areas. On the right side, you see a crop rotation sheet. This will be on, uh, on my PowerPoint. On the first box, you have legumes. The second one is roots. The third one is fruit. And the fourth one is our leaves. You need to rotate your crops to um, prevent plant diseases from developing. I love my father and he was a novice gardener. For many years, he planted his tomatoes in the same area, in the same spot until there was little or no production. He tried amending the soil with leaves, but was not patient enough to let them decompose. So he got frustrated and we went to containers. Number five, you wanna build, uh, focus on building a healthy soil. Soil is your friend and you need to take care of it. Composting is the best way to feed your soil. I make my own compost by recycling all our vegetable waste. We started with red worms in a compost bin that we bought from a sporting goods store. They were later taken over by what's called soldier flies. Here on the bottom, you'll see the soldier flies at work. Oftentimes we'll throw things in the evening, uh, vegetables in there and the next morning they'll be gone because the soldier flies come up at night. They look gross, but are more efficient than red worms. They're not a pest. They eat a lot and hatch just to reproduce. They do not have mouth parts and their only mission is to reproduce. A little trick, compost is expensive if you purchase it. If you don't need, you, excuse me, you do not need to spread compost all over the whole garden. You just need to spread compost on the areas that you're going to plant. Place one or two shovelfuls in the planting hole, mix it in before you plant your vegetables. You can use other materials to improve the soil, but be careful. Some manures have weed seeds and others are, have too much nitrogen, especially chicken manure, <clears throat> and will burn the plants. My wife and I had that experience. We lived in San Luis Obispo going to college and we lost our whole crop when I added chicken manure. The no-till method is a plant, excuse me. The no-till method is to plant plants that are deep rooted. We 
we used to throw out a few seeds of wheat. And it was fun to watch it grow and read the story of a little red hen with the kids. You can put cone flowers, rubecchia, cilantro, any plant with a deep root. Now, when it dies off, do not pull out the plant when it completes its cycle. You just wanna cut off the top and leave the roots down in the soil to decompose. Never, never, never leave your soil bare. The rule is if you don't plant something there, mother nature will. Watering. Water the soil, not the plant. The biggest complaint I receive from clients is, I have all plant but no tomatoes. My question is, is it near a water source, a sprinkler, or they're watering every day? Tomatoes will grow and grow and grow if you keep watering them. They're happy. Their thought is, I'm, going, I'm growing fine and I do not need to produce fruit. Tomatoes must be water stressed. In the early spring, I water once per week. Later, two to three times per week. And if it's really, really hot, I have to water just about every day. You want to water in the evenings. Drip system is not a save all. You are the gardener, which means you need to go visit your garden often and make sure everything is in order. Drip is only a tool and to be used when you go on vacation so your water doesn't die. Problems and pests. A healthy garden has few pests and the secret is to a healthy garden is the soil. Try to attract natural predators. We have oregano, wild sunflowers in our garden, which attract mason bees that do a better job at pollinating than honeybees. Do not buy ladybugs. They do fly away home. They collect them in the Sierra Nevadas. If you put them out here, that's where they go back because they go back to the Sierra Nevadas. You can handpick your pest in the early morning. We use Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt for caterpillars. It affects the caterpillar, but it's harmless to humans. I had a friend that her father would pay her a nickel a piece for picking the tomato hornworms off his tomatoes. So she got smart and was to cut them in half and she would get a dime for each one. Be willing to share some of your produce with nature. What we see in the market seems to be perfect because we shop for food with our eyes. There's nothing wrong with a little damage or blemish. Just cut it off and compost it. You can use rolled up newspapers for earwigs. Roll it up, place it in the garden, and the next morning pick it up and throw it into the trash. The earwigs will actually go into the, uh, the newspaper. You can also use jar lids with some used cooking oil. Just set it out in the evening and empty it in the morning. The earwigs will climb into the oil. You can put paper cups around stems to prevent cutworms or snails from eating your new plants. Diatomaceous earth is another uh, powder that you can purchase. It's actually used in swimming pools for filtering sometimes. It's good for snails and slugs because when they crawl over it, it slices them up and they ooze out their, um, their guts. <laughs> Remember, if you have a pile of debris close by, you're probably harboring insects. I had a friend that she called and says, you know, I have uh, uh, worms in my um, peaches every year. And I asked her, is there a, something nearby that they can uh, harbor over? And it was a, a wood pile. She had a wood pile next by and, and or rock pile. And that's where the worms were spending the winter. <clears throat> Keep a journal again. The Gardener's Companion is available from the Master Gardeners, a good choice, but any calendar. On the left side, you'll see my planting calendar. I just started writing down notes. Uh, I don't have a deep journal, but I kind of know when to plant and when to harvest. Um, I also have a gleaning calendar in the neighborhood. If you plant one peach tree, it's going to give you a couple hundred pounds of peaches. So what I do is I find people that have trees hanging over the fence, and I'll knock on the door and say, well, you're, are you willing to share? and I'll take them back some jelly or jams. I do that often with apricots. 
take notes on what worked and what didn't. Note the varieties. Don't be afraid to experiment. Last year, my wife and I experimented with long beans. Um, green beans have about a 60-day growing period, and they all mature at the same time. Long beans do not. They mature all summer long, and they're, uh, I found them just as tender as green beans. And, but you have to go out about every two days because they will grow from six inches to 18, 24 inches overnight. A little bit about herb, herb production, excuse me. Most herbs are deep rooted and grow, we, I grow them in pots. Coriander is a winter crop. A lot of people that I teach class to want to know why they can't grow cilantro. It's a winter crop. <laughs> Excuse me. You plant those seeds in August, September, October. Oregano is great for attracting bees. We have it all over our garden. Um, basil is a summer herb. It will produce all summer if you keep the flowers pinched off. We make pesto, freeze it into uh, ice tray uh, cubes. We put the cubes in a bag and we'll use them all year long with pasta or uh, by just taking out a cube and throwing it into the pasta. We do have a plant of rosemary in the garden. There's two kinds of rosemary, a low growing and a tall one, and they get pretty big. And we do keep chives in a deep pot. So whatever herbs that you use, um, take advantage of them and use them in your, in, in your meals. Okay. My quotes for the day. Remember to choose your battles. Choose wisely, choose ones you can win. Um, number two, plant what you're going to eat. Don't be afraid to experiment. Now, if you don't plant something in the soil, Mother Nature will, and it's often the weeds. Compost or cover it up with newspaper, put something there. I do, uh, I gather straw bales um, and I'll put straw over uh, bare soil. You can't fool Mother Nature, but you can trick her with little tricks. Uh, you can start your seedlings in six packs. And then as they grow, you can transform, transplant them into the ground. And last but not least, never give up. Enjoy life in the garden. And remember, gardening is cheaper than therapy. And uh, we always take a siesta. Okay, that's what I have. <laughs> Questions. Well, that was a lot of information. I'm really glad we did our recording this program. It will be posted on the uh, Fresno County Library site. It will also be going to the Master Gardeners. Uh, John, I was just curious uh, looking, at, do you have any uh, recommendations? Uh, for that you brought up tomatoes quite a bit, but any uh, other vegetables, especially for a uh, newbie person uh, to start with, for especially for this area? What we do is oftentimes we'll do uh, peppers, tomatoes uh, for a, a salsa garden. And um, we do squash quite a bit. You can, you can do a couple of... Uh, crops of, of squash, you do one now, and then in about four to five weeks, you do another, uh, start some more seeds. Uh, I would not do corn. Corn, I, like I mentioned, is a high nitrogen user. Just go down to the local farmer's market or something, pick up some ears of corn. Um, and they are, it's, corn is a grass. It, it, uh, it uses a lot of water and a lot of nitrogen. But simple things, um, cherry tomato, there's there are different sizes of tomatoes, Laura. There's a, a large, a medium, and a small. Uh, the cherries are, are prolific. Uh, they're easy to grow. And if you're just starting with tomatoes, I, I would start with cherry tomatoes. I would not do the large tomatoes um, until you're experienced. The big giant tomatoes, I've discovered that at a plant, you might give four or five large ones and they start going down in size but uh, tomato plants will produce all the way into the first frost. 
Wonderful. I uh, had someone ask about if you're gardening with children, do you have any uh, recommendations uh, on working uh, things that would work best with them? Start them early. I have a, a, a granddaughter that's eight years old um, that will not touch anything that's green. And her sister is 20 months old and she goes out to the garden and picks uh, our snow peas and eats them. Um, but what I've done with children is I've done gardens in containers. I have carrots in a pot and they'll pull them out and eat them. I also have uh, uh, strawberries in a pot. I'm not fighting the slugs or the earwigs in a strawberry bed. Um, Everything loves your strawberries, but I have them in a, in a large container. They're overhang on the container and the grandkids just come up and they'll dig through them to, to find uh, um, strawberries. They like the cherry tomatoes. Uh, they'll just pick them and eat them right off. Um, Sun Gold is a yellow. It's very, very sweet, non-acided, not acidic, um, which is a very good one. To that's great. Um, had another question regarding uh, a very specific one on any recommendations on cucumbers. A uh, person said their cucumbers came out quite bitter. And I was wondering if you had any uh, advice on that. I've never had success with cucumbers. We tried to grow Armenian cucumbers and instead of 12 or 15 inches, they were like two or three inches. Um, <laughs> I think you need a little more nitrogen. Uh, cucumbers will get bitter with the heat. And so you have to be cautious uh, later in the summertime. Um, they grow fast. The older they are, the, the, the more bitter they become. But uh, a lot has to do with the fertilization. Um, I don't use chemicals. I kind of use um, um, compost and uh, I may use some miracle Grow liquid uh, fertilizer that you just mix in a gallon of water. My suggestion to if you do that, use half the amount required. Uh, many people will use the full amount and sometimes you stress or burn the plant. Uh, but I suggest that if it says uh, one teaspoon per gallon, I'd do a half a teaspoon per gallon of water. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I had a question that's saying, uh, what do I do about mushrooms that are growing in my container with radishes and spinach? Will they hurt the veggies to the point that I can't eat them? Mushrooms won't hurt it. It's actually, uh, it's got roots all over the place. If you don't want them, you can change the soil. What's happened is the mushrooms are decomposing whatever came in the compost. Uh, um, so you've got some, some spores or mycorrhizae in there. They won't hurt the other plants, no. Um, I do not suggest that you consume them. Um, mushrooms are, you know, I'm not a, a mushroom person, um, but though they can be poisonous to humans, but they won't hurt your plants. And just pull them out. Remember the mushrooming part is only the fruiting part. There's a lot of mycorrhizae underneath and it's actually breaking down whatever is in the compost. Okay, how about someone else? My peaches are bitter and small. What can I do? Did you thin them out? You have <laughs> to thin out um, peaches. And that's one of the hardest things to do. Um, we pit thin them out to about that far apart, which is about four to five inches. Uh, I did that for my neighbor and uh, he was not happy with me. Um, Within the mountain, there's you probably lose a, at least half the crop, if not more, on the ground. But you have to do that to get any size. He was happy in July. He brought me a basket of peaches that were probably the softball size. Um, so, I don't fertilize my peaches. I do water them. Uh, I've started my first watering. I have peaches that come on on May 15th as my first peach. Uh, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit here. If you're doing fruit trees, buy fruit trees that will give you an early production because that's the expensive part is going out and buying peaches now. If you find any, they're probably shipped from South America or Central America. So you want peaches that are going to produce May, June, and July 
if you get a late peach, for example, August, September, you've taken care of your babies all summer long and you're not the only one that's hungry. Every insect in the neighborhood will come and attack your peaches. So I suggest if you want peaches in August, September, go down to the farmer's market, go to a packing shed and you can buy peaches uh, instead of babysitting all summer long and losing your crop to some insects. Uh, someone asks, how are parsnips? Will they grow locally? I've never grown parsnips. I think they will grow. Uh, you probably need a little bit more shade than, than uh, um, excuse me, a little bit more shade, a little bit more cooler area. Now, parsnips are a taproot. And I, I honestly, I, I, I'd have to do my homework. I really would. <laughs> you can check with the Master Gardeners. Uh, they have a hotline at, at, at the end of the uh, PowerPoint presentation. But if they're like carrots, uh, they have a cheap tap root. Uh, you can't start them in a seed pack. You'd have to start them in a container. I suggest start them in a pot that's 12 inches deep or more and experiment from there. Okay. Uh, Tammy asks, when pruning the tomato plants to encourage new growth, do you prune the lower leaves? I prune the lower leaves so the insects don't reach them. I bring, I'll bring it up. And there's actually on the axial, as the, as the plant's growing, there'll be, you'll have a, a side shoot. You can clip that off to give you a bigger size. I don't. I just let mine grow wild. Uh, I do put them in cages to go up. But the only leaves that I remove are the bottom ones so that insects, or earwigs, or snails can't uh, reach the leaves. I'm not sure how much this is directly towards a vegetable garden, but did have AJ ask, what are good plants to cover a wall? Do you have any tips to start? No, that's more of a horticultural. You want a climbing wall. Um, you don't want anything that's going to stick to the wall. Okay. <laughs> what you want to do is you're going to make a, a netting out of chicken wire or uh, some type of wire where you can where the plant can climb onto the wire, not the wall. Um, my guess is you probably want to cool that wall down a little bit. Um, um, I, I've lost my train of thought, but there's a, mm -hmm. there's a few plants. Um, Star jasmines was one, and there's another, Carolina jasmine is another one. Um, but if you check in the nursery, but what you want to do is you want to keep them away from the wall because the wall is hot. Uh, it will burn them. And so what you do is you, you build a little uh, trellis netting and let them climb up that. You know, uh, I have not really ever done vegetable gardening myself. I've learned a lot listening to you. I was surprised. It seems like you very rarely start your vegetables directly in the ground. You, it sounds like you almost always start them in a container. I always start my vegetables in a six pack or a, or a four inch pot with potting soil. I never start them in the ground. Uh, you're gonna fight weeds. You're gonna get disappointed. The insects or the soil, a bacteria will attack the seedlings. Um, I have a friend right now that's frustrated because uh, they put in uh, topsoil and uh, compost in and plant these seeds for the kids to watch them grow and they're not growing. So, but I have six packs uh, of, uh, uh, long beans of okra, um, those I'll transplant into uh, three and four inch or, or pint size. And then when they're a good size and they can withstand uh, the elements, I put them in the ground. But by that time I've cleared my bed, it's all clear, there's no weeds, so I'm not fun. Now, the only thing I may grow on the ground is radishes, but I like to put them in containers. Uh, I do have a, a container pot of radishes and garlic. Um, uh, I mix in my flowers with my vegetables, uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, you see the diversity. Yeah. How about, um, had Annette asked, what's the best fertilizer for onions and garlic? You can use a, uh, um, an all-purpose fertilizer. A 10-10-10 a is a good fertilizer. Um, like I say, if you use a liquid fertilizer, use half that um, I use Osmocote. 
I'll put osmocote and mix it in because it's a slow release fertilizer to break down. Compost is probably the best. If you can add two inches of compost per year to your garden, you're doing pretty good. Uh, also, I had a question. Where do you get the containers of the various sizes you uh, mentioned? You can probably... Uh, you can probably walk down the street and pick them up in a trash pile. Um, they're just six packs. You don't want to buy them. You can, you can purchase them. Um, they are expensive and they come in quantities. For example, you're talking about a thousand cell packs. I have uh, three in cell packs, but I buy, I buy it a lot because I do some propagation for other people and other programs. Um, you don't have to sterilize the container. You, if you use a, a, a plastic pot of some type from home, even uh, uh, plastic pots from, uh, from the box stores, you'll need to drill some holes in the bottom so, so the water drains through. I've noticed that all containers are black and I think that's to absorb the heat and to help the, the seeds germinate. Okay. Uh, looks like we have a pause in our questions, but if anyone has any, please feel free to send them in or to type it in the chat. In the meantime, I am going to hand this over for a moment to Roz, who is going to tell us about some of our upcoming programs, and there's some really good ones. Well, I'm so glad that everyone was able to join us today in our Growing with the Master Gardener series. There's another seven, excuse me, another five programs that we're going to be offering um, to the public. And these used to be our old, um, we called them adult education classes. So now what we want to do is um, just want to share with you some of the upcoming classes that will be happening. So on May 1st, Tim Sullivan is going to be offering a class on drought 2021. Um, just like we were in 2014-15, California is going into a drought again, and Fresno County is going to be in a severe drought. So I really recommend his class to learn about mulching and um, uh, compost and things like that and things that you can do for your uh, garden. Then on May 15th, I'm gonna be doing a class called Simplifying Succulents. It's gonna be talking about plant ID and care. And uh, all of these next classes are gonna be offered at 10 o'clock in the morning, not 11. On May 22nd, I'm gonna be doing something called Sassy Succulents. I'll be talking about different containers that you can use and different crafts that you can do with um, with succulents. On June 5th, Master Gardener Annie Dahl is going to be gardening with herbs. And then on June 19th, I'll be doing the final uh, succulent presentation, What's Eating My Plants. And that will be on the insects and bugs that attack them. And to uh, register for these classes, you can go to fresnolibrary.com libcal.com. And if you'd like to take a photograph of this, I'll leave this up for a second. So if you have your phone with you, you can see the classes that are going to be offered. And one thing I did want to mention, uh, John was talking about freezing um, his pesto that he's made. But for those that are growing uh, basil, you can also cut off the uh, leaves, wash them, dry them really well, and put them into a um, uh, freezer bag. And you can have what tastes like fresh basil all through the winter. And I do that. I've just used the last of my basil for this year and I'm getting ready to uh, plant my new basil plants. But just to talk a little bit about the classes that we're offering again, that Drought 2021 is on Saturday, May 1st. Here is Fresno County, and you can see that we're already in severe drought conditions. 
the uh, first class that I'm doing, Simplifying Succulents, here's a variegated Echeveria sunburst daonium. If you can come across any of these, I certainly recommend it. That will be on Saturday, May 15th. Uh, gardening with herbs will be on Saturday, June 5th. And just one last time, if you'd like to get in touch with the Master Gardeners, um, to reach our website, if you, uh, if you uh, click on or highlight this uh, website, it'll take you to the Master Gardener website. The second one will take you, if you have questions specifically for Master Gardeners, that's, um, we usually would have a phone number, but uh, we're working from home now, so everything is um, through email. And lastly, uh, if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, if you sign up here, it will take you to um, an area where you can sign up and get information about our classes from the, uh, from the Master Gardeners. And occasionally, if you've attended a class, they will send you a survey if you'd like to answer it. That helps us get funding for some of our programs and helps us know what we, um, which programs are well received and which ones are poorly attended. So again, I'd like to thank you all for attending our Growing with the Master Gardener series. And we look forward to you being able to see some of the other classes that we're offering um, in the next in the months of May and June. Thank you, Laura, for um, partnering with the Master Gardeners to offer these classes to the public. Uh, this is, thank you all. This is fantastic advice and information. And I know this is gonna be a lot of fun upcoming. I have to tell you, I'm really looking forward to the drought one myself. Um, don't know quite where to start sometimes. Uh, John did have an interesting question for you. This is from Mitchell, and he is doing a fifth grade project on urban farming. Would you consider a garden urban farming, and is it good for the environment? And does it have any, what are the positive and negatives, would you, in your opinion? Urban farming is just farming inside a city area, for example, uh, city limits. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's, uh, you don't need a, an acre or five acres to, to farm. Uh, you can, uh, my front yard, I removed my lawn about six years ago. It's got uh, six fruit trees, five, six fruit trees in the front. It, I plant uh, everywhere there's a drip emitter. I would put, for example, I put, uh, butternut squash plant. I got 75 pounds of butternut squash. Uh, last year we planted uh, green bean, uh, excuse me, long beans for the first time. I have wild sunflowers that come up and we leave them alone for the bees. And what we did is we put a long bean next to the wild sunflower. And as the long bean grew, it took over that wild sunflower. And we had uh, long beans all the way into the fall. Uh, I've planted tomatoes around my emitters, um, so you just I mix it in in the front. But um, as Roz was mentioning in this drought, we have to look at alternatives. Everybody has uh, um, yeah. everybody has lawns, but what can what can we do to reduce that impact? There's a lot of the schools in Fresno have gardens, and they're dormant because of the COVID, um, but if you can get kids involved, I did something with the uh, gate, uh, the gate uh, school in Fresno, and uh, those kids <laughs> thrive. They loved it. They take care of it. Uh, they harvested the flowers, they harvested the fruit, uh, and they did cuttings, uh, transplants. Uh, they just had a wonderful time, and it was a garden club because of the curriculum in the school is so intensive that a lot of them is, has to be in the garden club. Well, I have to say one of the things I've always envisioned, envisioned a garden of having had this big, huge lawn or a big spot that 
the vegetables have to be separate and protected, but it really sounds like you don't have to have a huge yard. You can even do quite a bit like out on a back patio and using containers and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a, you just scale it down. That's true, that's true. Uh, there was a question in the chat room about tomatoes in a container. You need a good size container, probably that, enough that'll hold about one cubic foot of soil. The larger tomatoes will not do well in a container. They just need a lot of space. And I, I have a favorite, it's called a rainbow. It's three colors and very flavorful. I've learned that the, the, the darker tomatoes, the yellow tomatoes uh, are sweeter. They're less acidic than the red tomatoes. So I often plant those uh, black Russians or uh, black cream or chocolate cherries. And then um, the medium sized salad tomatoes, uh, like early girl, those do okay in a container. You'll get a, a decent production. The brandy wines are another variety. And then the cherry tomatoes love it. You just have to support them uh, in a container. Um, but they, they go by sizes. And um, I, should, I tell people, don't put the large tomatoes in a container. You, you won't have, you won't be successful. Okay. Well, we have to wrap this up in just a few minutes. So uh, I'm just going to throw a couple more questions at you. Uh, what are good companion plants and flowers for a veggie garden? I plant flowers that will give me a deep taproot, like an echinacea, a purple cone flower, uh, a yarrow. Um, I don't plant flowers that will spread, for example, lantana, because it'll take over everything. I actually put my vegetable next to the flower. Um, and uh, I, I like uh, cilantro or coriander. Right now, mine is in full bloom. It's an... Um, uh, I believe it's called the umbrellifery flower. It's like an umbrella, but the insects love it and it's beautiful. And it'll go to seed. So I'll have seed for my coriander for next year. Um, uh, so I mix those in uh, with, with my plants. I do, I've never planted marigolds because uh, um, I did a, a job for a client this last week and she planted marigolds and there was nothing left but the flower, the, uh, the, something ate it. My guess would be snails or slugs. Um. Okay, and let's see. AJ had said he wanted to start a garden club at a local elementary, any advice? But I think he could also email this question to the master gardeners and get some really good advice on that as well. Um, do have a couple more uh, quick questions. Uh, Tammy uh, planted Brussels sprouts for the first time this summer. Any quick tips or tricks, tricks for that? Brussels sprouts are a winter crop. They are planted in August or September. Okay. So if you planted them now, I have my client planted uh, peas, sweet peas, about two weeks ago, and she's not going to get it. She won't receive a harvest. They'll just kind of die with the weather. Oh, uh, there was a question on beefsteaks. Beefsteak is a, uh, a hybrid. Uh, I use what's called Big Red. It's like beefsteak, uh, but it's an heirloom variety. And let's see, uh, a bug question. It says, we have a bug that attacks our pomegranates every year. Any suggestions? Uh, I need to know more information. I don't... I've never had problems with pomegranates. Um, I, I'd need to get more information or at least see the bug. Uh, and there is a, a website for the Master Gardeners, the Fresno County Master Gardeners uh, uh, chat line that you can either email, send a picture, or, or uh, and they will get back to you. And I think it's at the, it's at the end of the slides show. Okay, that's fantastic. I presume you could also Google like Fresno Master Gardeners to get to your website for that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think we'll wrap up our program for today. Uh, please join us for any of our other programs and register. Just remember that you do need to register for each program separately. If you register for one, it doesn't automatically sign you up for the next one. Also, uh, please visit the 
the Fresno Master Gardeners. They have a lot of good advice and information going on out there. This will be recorded. Uh, we recorded the program. It will be posted hopefully fairly quickly uh, at both the Fresno County website, Fresno Library website, and the Master Gardeners. Thank you, Roz and John, particularly. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you for doing that today. You're welcome. It's been fun. Thank you, guys. And I just wanted to mention two of the uh, cherry tomatoes that I like. One is called Sun Gold and the other one is Sweet 100. And um, I believe there's going to be a plant sale on the corner of Pico and Maroa at the end of the month. And that will go to benefit the master gardener. So if anybody's interested in some uh, plants, that would be a place to go. So again, thank you for attending our classes today and uh, look forward to seeing you at some of the other ones that we're offering in May and June. And thank you and everyone have a good weekend. Thank you.